question for you all this morning. Um, how are you? Good, good. Online, just tell the screen I'm listening. No. And I invite you to answer that question, not just from the state of your current affairs, um, but also I invite you to ask yourself how you generally answer that question. So there's lots of different categories of it. There's kind of the melancholy neutral of fine, okay, so-so, all right. You know, these are normally really humble people who somehow get how are you out even before they've finished answering, right? And then there are the incredibly positive people. <laughs> how are you today? Wonderful, fantastic, perfect, really perfect? Couldn't it be better? Uh, incredibly annoying to the melancholy neutral people. <laughs> I particularly like this answer when it's really sincere and from the heart. I have a, a mentor and friend, Charlie McClung, who when I was about uh, 18 years old, got me in the habit of when anyone asked me, how am I? I always answered better and better for about six years. How are you? Better and better. And it was really cool because it opened up this ability to see that life can be more and more, that it can get better and better. Uh, and so I loved practicing that for many years. And then it became a little like shtick. You know, friends would make bets. I'll give you five bucks if you can get them to answer something differently than better and better. And I remember I was talking with my friend Bruce Snow, and he said, how are you? And I said, better and better. How are you? And he said, better than you are. And then I knew it was time to retire it for a while. You know, to, to, you know, practice this spiritual practice of being authentic. You know, because the, the truth is, uh, I'm a very complicated person. How about you? I've got, I've got many layers. When you ask me, how am I? I want to answer, well, which me are you referring to? This could come off a little weird, right? <laughs> But, uh, you know, I can contain in, uh, many feelings uh, at a time. I'm uh, frustrated and joyful. I'm whole, perfect, and ticked off. <laughs> I'm okay, not okay. <laughs> you ever been in that place? Yep. I'm okay, not okay. Walt Whitman said it best. He said, so I contradict myself. I contain multitudes. You know, good response next time someone calls you on your stuff. <laughs> In New Thought, um, we're very positive people. You know, William James in the 19th century wrote The Varieties of Religious Experience. And in it, he refers to our blossoming faith as the religion of healthy-mindedness. He calls us the healthy minds. And we do have this way. We can take any challenging word or condition and turn it into a positive phrase. You know, I'm not sick. I'm going through a process of healing. My hamster didn't die. He's making his transition. <laughs> Everything is just wonderful. I just don't know it yet. <laughs> and, and, and I love this practice of using positive words. It's very important because it helps us get out of the negative thinking track and helps us to identify what we want to experience. So it's very powerful. However, if you're not careful, it can become kind of a shield against what really is going on in your life. It can become a, a kind of spiritual bypass, as we call it, from facing the challenges that may be before us. Uh, in our philosophy as well, we've pretty much invented phrases like, it's all good, and all is well, or everything is in divine right order. And we say those things because it speaks to our core spiritual belief the core spiritual belief of our teaching is that there is a divine spiritual perfection in, through, and around everything, always. And when we bring consciousness and awareness to this fact of the divine perfection that runs through everything, it begins to cultivate and take root in our lives, resulting in a kind of harmony where we then experience ourselves as weaving this awareness of the divine perfection in and throughout our relationships, our work, our communities, our world. It's what we believe in. It becomes almost like a dance, even in the midst of challenges in our lives, we dance with this, this sacredness. 
we call it forth even when we experience its absence. Several weeks ago, someone asked me over text how I was doing, and I replied, all is well, kind of. All is well, kind of. And I looked at it, and I felt pretty silly at first. But then I got to thinking about it, and it really was true for me. Because in my life, I can maintain an awareness that there is a divine spiritual perfection back of every situation, available in every person, available in me. I can maintain that awareness and be hurting and be scared about how something's going to work out and be conflicted and challenged. I can contain those multitudes. And when we look at the world today and we see the struggles, there is no greater realization that is needed in the world than that all is well. And yet, if we want to be a relevant spiritual teaching in our lives And for the world, we have to recognize that all is well isn't the right reaction to everything. We have to understand its purpose. We can't say 40-some thousand people have died in an earthquake, all is well. We can't say all is well when we see, uh, oh no, another video of a a black man being uh, murdered by someone in in authority. No. We can't look at the Ukraine or look at a a six-year-old bringing a a gun to school and shooting their teacher and say, all is well. It's the right overall response, but it's not the right reaction. The reaction, the right reaction is, is, is sorrow or outrage or just that, that quiet mourning and grief in order to bring forth a consciousness of hope, a consciousness of solution, a consciousness of healing into our lives, we sometimes first have to acknowledge the hurt and the pain. If not, this idea that that all is well um, lacks relevance. It becomes a form of denial. And so it is our calling as spiritual practitioners not to turn away from the negative conditions of the world, but to turn into them with a faith and a knowledge of what can be better, of what can heal, of who we are really and truly meant to be. And it takes some important understandings. This first one sounds simplistic, but it's hard for us who've been in this teaching for a long time. It's the simple recognition that there are terrible things that happen in the world. We live in this sacred, beautiful expression called earth, and yet there are bad things that are happening all the time. And again, it's not the right response to say all is well. It's the right response to bring a consciousness of wholeness, a consciousness of willingness for healing to take place, to to have those come forth. You know, one of the best things I think we human beings have done in this last decade is we sent Captain Kirk to outer space. (laughs) right, William Shatner, 90 years old, went on the Jeff... Bezos spaceship and went to outer space. How cool is that? Human beings did that. We love you, Captain Kirk. Uh, Tells you something else about our spirituality here. (laughs) But when he returned to ground, he didn't return elated or joyful or even mesmerized. He shares that he returned with an immense sadness, an immense sadness. He shared, I was crying I didn't know what I was crying about. I had to go off someplace and sit down and think, what's the matter with me? And I realized I was in grief. It was the death that I saw in space and the life force that I saw coming from the planet, the blue, the beige, and the white. And I realized one was death and the other was life. I saw more clearly than I ever have with all the studying and reading I've done, the writhing, slow death of earth and we on it. It's a little tiny rock with an onion skin air around it. That's how fragile it all is. It's so fragile, we hang by a thread. We're just dangling. I was tempted to do it in Captain Kirk voice, (laughs) but I think it would would take that, that kind of gut punch effect. See, sometimes... To approach great grief or sadness or something that's, that's wrong, we have to, have to also behold the beauty, the dignity, the humanity in what we hold and know that that is the real and meant to be thing. 
but we can't heal if we don't acknowledge. As a religious scientist, I don't believe in evil as a thing in itself, but I sure the hell can see it in expression out there in the world. And for us, we don't believe that evil comes from some dark Lord. We believe it is the result of ignorance. It is ignorance to the grace of God. Ignorance to the truth of who we are when we mistreat one another. Ignorance to our own divine being when we reject ourselves. Ignorance of that all is wellness, that hope and that divine spark available for all humanity when we act out of place to it. And I would argue today that it is ignorance when we don't confront violence, racism, sexism, whatever ism you want to share or identify. It is ignorance when we we don't bring a remembrance of the truth, a remembrance of who we're meant to be, of how things should be based upon the divine potential that has been innate and planted in each one of us to bring forth. I also think it's important to point out that in our teaching, we don't necessarily believe in a, in a divine presence that's pulling the strings, that's making this happen or this not happen. We believe in a, in a divine sacred presence that is enabled, that has endowed each of us with the potential to bring forth the sacred and love and light and well-being and healing and harmony in all that we do, but it's up to us. God made the world, but we make it the way it is through our choices. And we experience the consequences, positive or negative, of what those are. And sometimes I'll be working with someone and they'll say, Josh, how could God let this happen? Oh, I get it. I get it. How, how do you see God in this situation? And my first, maybe not the most empathetic response is, I, I don't believe in, in a God that, that lets things like that happen. I think we do those things. And yes, when I look at that situation, I don't see God in that at all. But that doesn't mean that I don't see God in the the response. When we see something tragic happen in a community and we we see the, the community come together to create a sense of healing and love and restoration. I don't see God in the event, but I can see it in the response. You know, Ernest Holmes, our founder, he was fond of using the metaphor for God or the creative medium of electricity, of electricity. And he would share that he'd be talking with an electrician and an electrician would say, seriously, it doesn't exist until you turn the switch on. It's not there until you turn the switch on. And it's a good analogy for seeing God in our lives and in the world. It's not that God is absent, but it sometimes requires turning on our consciousness and our awareness to to see that divinity. It is then that we see part of our human role, part of the human sacrament, is that through our awareness of that divine perfection, we bring it forth. We make it real. And we can help heal our relationships and restore Mother Earth and live in greater unity and harmony with one another by being aware of this divine perfection, this divine truth. We see it when it plays out, and when we don't see it, it so offends our soul that we are called forth to confront those situations with a divine awareness and a greater amount of heart. Two things that I think can really keep us from realizing the truth of all is well and to applying it to our everyday lives. The first is conflict And the second is comfort. Conflict and comfort can keep us blind to the truth that all is well and integrating it into our lives. Conflict, because so many of us, when we get into challenges and we get into problem, we identify so much with the problem that we forget all about solution. I am so caught up in my righteousness about being right in this argument and being mad at you, that I won't even begin to think about reconciliation. We see this in the the world as well when we're, we're so good, we're getting so good at identifying problems, which is so important, 
but we sometimes miss out on the solutions. Dr. Sean Ginry has written a powerful book called The Four Pivots, Reimagining Justice, Reimagining Ourselves. And one of his four pivots is, is about the importance of moving from a place of problem to a place of solution. And he points out that unintentionally, so many of us, we, we fall in love with the problem. He says the problem with problem loving is that we become satisfied with discussing the problem and uncomfortable with imagining solutions. And he humbly tells the story of, of himself. He's a sociologist and a teacher, and he's working with a group of principals trying to um, share and educate them about the disparities that are facing black youth in schools. And he shares that he put them in their breakout rooms. He showed all the PowerPoints, all the evidence laid out on the table and got them uh, together. And there's a principal that comes back and says, can you provide us with some solutions to these racial disparities in academic outcomes? And Ginwright shares, the question puzzled me because my assumption was that once they understood how significant the racial disparities were in their schools, the principals and teachers would come up with solutions on their own. I was wrong. And he goes on to say something really powerful. The most important aspect of social change, and I would add personal change, is not problem analysis, power building, narrative change, or coalition building. It's healing. Ram Dass tells us that, that healing isn't curing. It's what brings us closer to God. And in our own experience, in our own lives, that's how so many of us experience restoration, by getting back to the truth of who we're meant to be getting back to the truth of the sacred within all of life. It can be messy work getting there, but each of us has that ability to remember and acknowledge our spiritual truth and to make sure we speak it in our relationships, in our work, back at the world that is sometimes screaming at us for help, to know and remember the truth without any illusions of the challenges that may be there. So be willing to move from conflict to calling, that calling to bring a more profound and deep awareness, a willingness to heal and rebuild trust in our lives. But also, don't fall victim to comfort. I love being comfortable, don't you? I love being warm and snuggy, happy, well-fed. I could just stay that way forever. But I don't because of, of calling. And when we get too comfortable, we can get into that habit of wanting to, to not look at problems in our lives or in our world. We become complacent and comfort, if you're not careful, can become apathy. And, and so we're, we're charged in our life to continue to choose our, our calling. You know, my favorite example of this is the great civil rights leader Clarence B. Jones who was becoming a successful attorney in California. He graduated law school and he got a house and it was during the same time of the Montgomery bus boycott, Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and all of that in Alabama. And Jones get, gets a call, his wife actually gets the call that King is gonna be in town and he wants to meet with Jones. And so they arrange this meeting at Jones's home. They sit down and, and, and King shares with him, I need young black professionals to come and help me in this work. And Jones considers it, and he answers no. California, Alabama, <laughs> lots of money, maybe no money at all. Yeah, I resonate and get why he said no. And King shakes his hand, and he leaves, and he shares what happened with his wife, Jones does, and she's furious with him. You said no to Martin Luther King Jr. And there's a phone call the next day, and it's King's assistant, and King's assistant says, Dr. King forgot to invite you to a sermon he's giving at a local church tomorrow morning. And so the wife hangs up the phone and she says to Clarence, you may not be going to Montgomery, Alabama, but you are going to that church service tomorrow morning. <laughs> and they come in and there's seats reserved for them right there in the front row. And King gets up and he says, the text of today's sermon is the role of the Negro professional in uplifting those less fortunate brothers and sisters in the South. <laughs> and Jones shares um, being in awe of King and being touched in his heart by the power of his message and feeling the weight and the breath of his calling. 
And at the end of the service in the receiving line, he went up to Dr. King. He said, when are we leaving for Montgomery, Alabama? And Jones would be the central writer of the I Have a Dream speech given on the National Mall. A speech that perhaps more than any other speech or moment in American history touched and transformed and evolved somewhat the consciousness of our country. Comfort or calling? Comfort or calling? Comfort sometimes feels like it's going to be consistent for us. Calling, it's scary. We've got to be brave. We've got to be in the unknown. But we're spiritually mature and powerful and courageous enough to do just that, to be willing to speak the truth in our lives, to be willing to speak the truth to ourselves and to live up to it, to be willing, even in a world that sometimes appears like it is falling apart, to hold its wholeness in our heart and to be a presence for its continued as a society. The world's usually doing pretty good on its own for all of us people to uplift and live a life with heart and spiritual courage. So let's move into prayer. If you so choose to join me this morning, I invite any of our practitioner prayer partners to stand. So we uplift each and every one of ourselves in this community and each and every human being everywhere, recognizing that whether one is in a state of sorrow or suffering or upliftment in joy, that the same divinity is ever present and ever available. And so we can ask ourselves in this prayer today, what is the God that I am brave enough and willing enough to call forth in my life and for all people? Let us call, call forth a God of healing, a God of understanding, a God of making connections. A God that can indeed make a way out of no way. May we open our hearts this morning to that recognition that that all is well truth is ever present, even when it seems like it's all messed up. We have that ability to call it forth, to know that even in chaos there is peace, that even in fear there is faith, that even in what may seem fractured, there is divine connection. And this thing called our consciousness can bring forth this recognition in a way that can help us transcend the limiting, tired out thinking that isn't working anymore and can transform us into being a presence for divine light, divine love, and divine well-being. May we embrace our own power in this moment, that power of the divine in us, calling to come forth to bless in new and profound ways. May we stand in the fire, knowing that that divine transformation leads us through. And so it is.